الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته and welcome to lessons in fiqh the chapter we're studying is the chapter that deals with ghusl the obligatory or the total bath and the hadith we have before our hands is hadith number 100 and uh, uh, who among us will read it inshallah brother Muhammad right. narrated by Abu Sa'id al-Khuduri May God be pleased with him. Allah's Messenger وسلم, said, Taking a bath on Friday is a must for every adult. Okay, I think that the following hadith is also connected to it, so I think it's relevant that we also read it. Brother Muhammad? <coughs> read it by Samura. May Allah, be May Allah be pleased with him. Allah's Messenger وسلم, said, Whoever performs ablution on the day of Jum'ah has done a good thing, and whoever takes a bath, takes, taking a bath is better for him. Now, these hadiths seem to conflict with each other because the first hadith tells us that it is a must, it's mandatory to take a bath uh, on the day of Jum'ah. And the other hadith tells us that if you take a bath, it's good, and if you perform ablution, it's also good. So it's better to take a bath, but Ablution does the job. So what is the verdict on uh, uh, Friday's obligatory bath? Is it a must or not? If you look at the first hadith, you will see that the Prophet says it is a must on every adult. And this includes females, includes women. <coughs> but the consensus of scholars that women are exempted from this hadith. They're not included. So uh, there are loopholes in this hadith that one could follow and say, well, then, if, it, if they're exempted from this hadith, why not males also to be exempted from this hadith? Why make it a must in the first place? And if, we, if you read the hadith, the original hadith, it, it has a prolonged version, a longer version that says the Prophet ﷺ said, that taking a total bath on the day of Friday is a must on every male adult and the siwak and putting perfumes. <clears throat> so the consensus of scholars that using the siwak, if you remember the, 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 the thing that we brush our teeth with, uh, uh, using the siwak and, performing and putting perfume for the day of Jum'ah is not a, obligatory, it's not a must. So the Prophet said, having a total bath, using the suwak, and putting perfume. So the scholars have two different opinions. The majority say it is not a must. It's preferable. And a big chunk of scholars, a lot of other scholars say, no, it is a must to take the obligatory uh, 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 bath. Why is that? They say because this hadith says that we should do it. <coughs> and there's another hadith that uh, uh, states that Uthman ibn Affan, may Allah be pleased with him, came to the mosque while Umar ibn al-Khattab, the second caliph, was delivering the speech. And he came late. So Umar did not address Uthman directly. He said, how come some people come late for Friday? It's not a good thing to do, to make it a habit to come late on Fridays while the Imam is, is, is giving the speech. So Uthman spoke out and he said, Well, uh, a Khalifa, O Caliph of, of, of the Messenger, وسلم, excuse me, pardon me, but I did not realize it was Friday uh, uh, prayer until I heard the Adhan of the, the mosque. So I immediately performed the ablution and came to the mosque. So Umar 
رضي الله عنه said you performed ablution and did not wash for ghusl did not make ghusl you did not take obligatory bath total bath don't you know that this is a must so scholars say Umar telling Uthman that he should have taken a total bath means that it's a must in another hadith Sa'ad ibn Abi Waqqas may Allah be pleased with him told his son to perform ghusl for Friday so the son said his son said that I have performed ghusl after having intercourse with my wife he said no this is not enough make another one for Friday so the group of scholars that say that said that it's obligatory they have evidence from the hadith of the Prophet from the actions of Umar and from the actions of Sa'ad bin Abi Waqqas now those who say no it is not obligatory say it because of the hadith of the Prophet when he said it's a must on every adult plus siwak plus perfuming and the later two is not a must it's a sunnah it's preferable so why not make the first one also likewise a preferable thing to do and again they have other evidences <coughs> such as Ibn Abbas may Allah be pleased with him explains to us when someone of some of his companions came to him and said Ibn Abbas uh, 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 is showering is taking the uh, obligatory bath for Jum'a a must or it's recommended preferable he said I'll tell you the story behind that at the time of the Prophet all the companions used to work where did the companions used to work uh, Fadi in the market markets Muhammad factories ma seaports Mustafa Marcus or Medina what was Medina famous for trading Medina dates farming farms, farms. farms. Oh. it was filled with farms so most of the companions used to work in farming so Ibn Abbas explains they used to work in farming from early in the morning and they used to have only one garment they didn't have, you know, a, a wardrobe full of suits and Armani's and Versace's or whatever. They had only one garment that uh, uh, protected them and that, you know, covered their bodies. So, it, usually it was made of wool. And wool is very tough and it's very hot. Therefore, whenever they came to the mosque for Friday uh, uh, a prayer and they all sat down, they started to smell and they of course you don't feel uh, comfortable when everybody else is smelling including yourself you feel agitated so they felt very bad about it so the prophet Ibn Abbas says the prophet came to, to them and said that it is a must on every adult to wash himself himself once a week and this was the uh, uh, origin of washing or taking the total bath for Jum'a. Ah. So from this Ibn Abbas tells us that this means that if you are clean and you do not smell then you don't have to take a bath. It's okay that you do not bathe for Jum'a, ah, for Friday. And the other hadith, hadith uh, of Samura, the Prophet tells us whoever bathes, this is great but whoever performs ablution, this is acceptable. <clears throat> if you perform ablution for Jum'ah, this is acceptable. But it's greater that you take a total or obligatory uh, uh, bath. Now, the thing that I would like to point out is, unfortunately, there are some Muslims that smell. And this is unacceptable. You should always maintain to have a good smell in your body you know some of the brothers have odor and some of the brothers once you smell them you say oh dear this is too much and, and, and they should do something about it and Islam tells us you have to wash you have to shower you have to clean yourself now it doesn't tell you go to the extent of 
buying deodorants and put perfumes and put makeup on. No, not to that extent, but you have to maintain the minimal uh, level possible, which is you must not uh, 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 harm others with your smell. And that is why in Islam, you're not allowed to enter the mosque if you have eaten onions or, garlic. or garlics. Though it's something useful for your body, but imagine you sitting, and we see this among some of the brothers, you know, in, in prayer in Maghrib or Isha, and the Imam says, well, and he says, Ameen. And this odor comes out, and you see people left and right falling on the floor of the smell. What the heck? This is unacceptable. Ac acceptable. Prophet ﷺ tells us that the angels <clears throat> are annoyed with the things that annoy humans, such as onions, garlics, and so on. So a Muslim is always clean and smelling nice. You cannot call people to Islam when you're smelly or when you're dirty, and you can afford not to be. Now, I'm not talking to a poor person that has nothing. He cannot buy soap, uh, uh, soap. he cannot buy uh, uh, deodorants, he cannot buy perfumes. This guy needs charity. I cannot tell him, don't come to the mosque. No, come into the mosque. It's Allah's, it's Allah's uh, uh, house. It's Allah's place of worship. But if you can afford it, then this is unacceptable. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam once saw a man, and the man was poorly dressed, and his hair was un untidy. So the Prophet asked him, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, do you have money? He said, yes. He said, what kind of money? He said, all kinds, Prophet. I have camels, I have cows, I have sheep. So the Prophet said, SubhanAllah, Allah Azza wa Jal, if he blesses someone and gives him wealth, he, he would like to see it apparent on his appearance. So the man went and he put some oil on his head, he calmed it, uh, uh, and he dressed nicely, he washed, he perfumed, and came to the Prophet ﷺ, and the Prophet was satisfied with him. This does not mean that you go and spend thousands and th thousands on designers' clothing or, or on uh, expensive watches. And, no, this is not what Allah wants you to show off. He wants you to, pe to be properly dressed, clean, and you don't smell. And that is why the scholars say that it is not a must for you to take a total bath, obligatory bath for Jum'ah, unless you smell. If you smell, then you have to uh, take a bath, and you, it's recommended, highly recommended, that you have a, a set of clothes specially designated to be worn in uh, Jum'ah or in Eid, as the Prophet ﷺ used to do. We have a short break, so please stay tuned, and we will be right back, inshallah. <laughs> Assalamu alaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh and welcome back. Just before the break, we were talking about ghusl al jumuah and if it's obligatory or recommended. And the question to you, Mustafa, is what was the verdict, the final verdict? That it is uh, recommended or uh, preferred that okay. we do. That is correct. The authentic and correct, most correct verdict is that it is recommended. And this is the choice of uh, Ibn Taymiyyah. May Allah have mercy on his soul. He said that it's recommended unless a person smells. And if he, if he has an odor, then he, it's a must that he performs uh, uh, obligatory uh, ghusl, obligatory bath. The following hadith is uh, read by Noor. Okay. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Narrated by... Ali, may Allah be pleased with him, the Prophet wasallam, used to teach us the Quran except when he was in a state of sexual impurity. Okay, the, the hadith was narrated by Ali, the Prophet wasallam, used to teach us the Quran except when he was in a state of sexual impurity, unless he was junub. And we discussed this issue before, so I don't think we have to 
uh, uh, go through it again, but just as, as a reminder. Now, there's a difference between touching the Holy Quran and reciting it. We said that the consensus of scholars, the four schools of thought in Islam, the school of Abu Hanifa, Malik, al Shafi, and al Hanbali school, they all agree that it is forbidden to touch the Holy Quran. There's no difference among them in this issue. And we said that reciting the Quran, there's a difference between a person who has a sexual impurity due, uh, uh, due to intercourse and a menstruating woman. Now, in the case of sexual impurity, Janaba, it is far easier to get rid of this state than it is with a, a, a woman in her uh, monthly period. Because this woman may take seven days, eight days to uh, get pure. And in the case of a, a woman that has given birth to a child, she would probably take 20, 30, maybe 40 days until she's pure. So by us coming to her and, and telling her, you must not recite the Quran, th that would be too much, asking too much, because one should always be connected to Allah Azza wa In the case of this junub, in the case of this person with sexual impurity, he would not last more than four or five hours because prayer is coming. So he has to perform ghusl and pray. So if we tell him, stop these two, three or five hours without reciting the Quran, that would not be asking too much of him. So uh, uh, the authentic, inshallah, and the correct verdict is that they should not read the Quran, just to be on the safe side. The one that has sexual impurity. Except, if you recall, Fadi? Yeah, well, if he is going to recite it before he goes to bed. Okay, and, okay. and we justified this by saying that the supplication that one says before going to bed is not considered to be reciting the Quran. Though he is reciting Ayat al-Kursi, Qul Huwa Allah, had the last three chapters of the Quran, but he's doing this because he is doing it as a form of supplication before going to sleep. So this is uh, 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 agreed upon and it's okay for uh, a person to do that. Now, uh, uh, the Hadith of Ali tells us that the Prophet used to teach us the Quran. The only thing that would prevent him from teaching us the Quran is being on the state of sexual impurity. And this is acceptable and we said that one should avoid uh, uh, this. Um, I think that this is all that we have uh, regarding this hadith. We spoke earlier about not misusing the Quran by hanging it in your, our necks or putting it under a pillow or putting it in our cars as a protector. And this is not acceptable uh, uh, or permitted in the Quran, in, in, in Islam, because this is insulting the Quran. The Quran has been revealed to the Prophet ﷺ has been uh, given to us so that we can read it and do and apply what's in it, the instructions that are uh, embedded in it. Not to hang it on walls or to hang it uh, in a necklace or to put it in uh, uh, a car or in a flight kit or whatever. Fadi, you had something to ask? Yeah, I have a question. So if someone recites the Quran in a state of when he's impure at a, during daytime and not at night, has he committed the sin? If he does so, or <coughs> not? It's, it's a rule of thumb. Always put it in your mind. Whenever we say that this is forbidden, mm. or not permissible, or haram, this means that whoever does this has committed a sin. Now, sins vary. There are major sins, and there are minor sins. But still, there are sins. And whenever we say it's obligatory, mandatory, wajib, fard, you have to, you must, then this means that if you do not do it, then you have committed a sin. Now, preferable things, we say, it's preferred that you do this. It's recommended that you do this. If you do them, you're rewarded. But if you don't, you're not uh, uh, punished for that. This would not be considered a sin because it's preferable, it's not obligatory. And on the other hand, the 
not recommended things, al-makruh, if you do them, there isn't a sin on you. But if you abandon doing them, if you do not do them, Allah will reward you for that. And then there's the last and final thing, which is in between, which is mubah. mubah. What is mubah is permissible. So everything in this life has five names or five is divided into five categories it's either obligatory on one side or forbidden muharram or it's either recommended and preferable or not recommended or not preferable and the fifth one which is permissible whether you do it or not it's up to you must i drink this glass of water one says it's recommendable no it's not one says, no, it's not recommendable. No, it's not again. So what is it? It's permissible. If I drink it, it's okay. If I don't, it's okay. <clears throat> when does it become obligatory for me to drink this glass of water? If I am going to die out of thirst and I don't want to drink this water, I'm going to die. It's obligatory for me to drink it. When it's forbidden for me to drink it, if I am fasting or if there is Najasa, if there is filth, then it's haram. I know it. It's haram for me to drink it. Or if it's poisonous. So you always have to label everything, whether it has these five categories. Forbidden, obligatory, preferred, not preferred, and permissible. So we come back to uh, uh, your question. Your question was, I forgot. When you recite the Quran during daytime and not at night, you told us we're supposed to stay away from it. Yes. But if we do, it's not a sin. Right? Yes, that because during the daytime or nighttime, it is forbidden for you to recite the Quran when you are in the, in the state of sexual impurity unless it is part of supplication. So whether the, the timing it doesn't matter, it, it, it has no significance, whether it's day or night. The state you're in, it, uh, is uh, what matters here. Um, again, <clears throat> I think we should go on to the following hadith, hadith number 103. Narrated by Abu Sa'id al Khudri, may Allah be pleased with him, Allah's Messenger وسلم, said, If one of you has sexual intercourse with his wife and wishes to repeat, he must perform ablution between them. Al Hakim added, Ablution makes one more active for repeating the sexual act. Now, uh, 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 this hadith talks about performing ablution between intercourses. If a person performs intercourse and wants to repeat this uh, uh, process again, then it's recommended that he performs ablution before doing that. And the Prophet ﷺ justified this by saying it makes him fresh, more active. Uh, the following hadith, hadith number 104. Narrated by Aisha, may Allah be pleased with her. Whenever Allah's Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam take a ghusl, took a ghusl, meaning a bath, after sexual intercourse, he would begin by washing his hands, then pour water with his right hand on his left hand and wash his sexual organs. He would then perform ablution, then take some water and run his wet fingers through the roots of his hair. Then he would pour three handfuls of water on his head, then pour water over the rest of his body, and subsequently wash his feet. Agreed upon, and the, work, and the wording is Muslims. Al-Bukhari and Muslim reported from Maimuna, may Allah be pleased with her, Allah's Messenger وسلم, poured water over his private parts and washed them with his left hand. He then struck his hand against the earth. In another narration, he, rub, he rubbed it, his left hand with the surface soil. And in the end of this narration, then... I brought him a towel, but he returned it and began wiping off the water with his hand. Agreed upon. Now, to go through this hadith, I think we need some more time, and we are just about to finish this uh, program. Therefore, I'll delay it to the next time we meet, inshallah, and I'll conclude this uh, uh, program by elaborating a little bit on ablution uh, uh, after sexual intercourse. Now, Aisha tells us that the Prophet ﷺ, has advised those who want to repeat the process of going back 
to uh, intercourse again to wash, to perform evolution. Is it a must? No, it's not a must. But evolution itself reduces the heat and tension in a, in a person and it refreshes him again. And it, it, we are ordered to uh, perform a, a evolution in a various of, uh, of places, such as before going to bed. It is a sunnah that a Muslim performs evolution before going to bed. And why is that? Because the minute he does this, Allah Azza wa Jal would have an angel protecting him and make, praying for, for this uh, uh, man. So with, whenever he wakes up in the middle of the night, whenever he wakes up because of his sleep uh, uh, on the state of, of uh, Tahara and he performs evolution, the minute he wakes up and makes dhikr and asks Allah for anything, Allah will grant him this thing. So the catch is, that we all should perform ablution before going to bed. So if we die, we die on a state of tahara, of purity. And if we wake up, we call Allah Azza wa Jal, oh Allah grant us a good wife, grant us uh, uh, wealth, grant us health, then Allah will answer our call. I'm afraid that this is all the time we have for today's program. And until we meet next time, fi amanillah, wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.